Okay, we are now recording. Uh, this will then record, and as I said, I will upload the material to Loop later this afternoon once it processes. It takes a while, so I just need to terminate the chat and let that process before my next class. So when we're looking at passing off, we're kind of doing a test module, a test class of this on Tuesday, and I know some people were here for that. Um, thanks for setting in. It was actually really helpful for me to really get a better grip of the on um, this digital teaching. Um, I'm big so when we're looking at I need to get rid of this. Is a couple of minutes. Uh, when we're looking at passing off. Uh, give me one second. I need. I need to add in the box, that thing on the side in the background for myself. Uh, um. So, yeah, when we're looking at this, uh, but it may be cursing because this decides not to work anymore. Sorry about that. Uh, just some technical issues from my end relating to the chat function being turned off. Uh, yep. So when we're looking at this, we're looking at the idea of passing off and where it really came from. It, that it wasn't economic tort. It's where a consumer is misled to the origin of the good or service as a result of uh, of the mislabeling or questionable branding, uh, and whether this was intentional or not is something we'll be looking at a little bit later today. But you can see there, what's designed as an economic tort and the remedy sought is to protect the business, plaintiff's business interests and the good, their goodwill or reputation. And we were looking at where this comes from, what is goodwill, what is reputation. And it is just that area of ensuring your brand for a, as a general term is protected and no one is trying to pass himself off as your brand. And we'll be looking at that. So, the essence that you can see there is, of the, is the essence of the port is that one trader represents uh, its goods and, and or services of those as another. And this can be as a result of many factors. Uh, is it uh, similar labeling? Is it intentional, uh, intentionally disguising the product as a competitor's to confuse or uh, pass, and effectively pass yourself off as the other product at a glance? So if, for example, you're at a supermarket, you're walking down the aisle, you see two packets of fig rolls with red labeling saying fig rolls. Uh, is it McVitie's? Is it Jacob's? You know, you have a preference for one, but at, at a glance, can you tell the difference between the two? And this is an actual, the actual, an actual case between McVitie's and Jacob's regarding the packaging of their, their respective fig rolls. And you can see the two cases there, Polycell products versus O'Carroll and uh, others, and O'Neill's Irish International Sports versus O'Neill's Footwear. It's effectively the nature of tort is to is of the tort is to defend in its name. The wrong is that of passing off one's good as another. So it is quite forward. Uh, it is quite clear when it is passing off or not, or when there can be an, a case of passing off. And this is one of the main cases we'll be looking at: the McBride Limited versus Joseph uh, Brennan Bakeries, where we were looking at this on Tuesday, just how the courts were looking at approved the idea of passing off uh, from the record and. Bowman Products Limited uh, versus Borden Limited case in the UK, where they created the three elements that are required. There has to be an established goodwill or reputation associated with the good or service, and the product is recognized by the public large. The, they, must, they must demonstrate a misrepresentation, misrepresentation to the public, which is likely or will cause association and confusion between the two products. 
and you, they must demonstrate that the plaintiff has or is likely to suffer as a result of this confusion. So with the passing off, it, it can be a preemptive tort. You can use it uh, to seek an injunction to stop uh, your a competitor trading under a brand name or with a, certain, with a certain product in a certain manner to stop future confusion or to stop future harm. Or if it's already happening, you can sue for damages. And these would be normally nominal damages and a cease and desist that they would have to stop trading in this manner. Uh, but if you can catch it before it causes the problem, you can get you can just make them stop uh, selling the product in that manner. And we've been you can see there that the intention to deceive them it's itself isn't an, is an intention. But you can have a product in uh, that is similar to a competitor's product, product because it makes good design sense. And I harped on about this a little bit in the last class. Certain design aesthetics are quite good, certain ones are not. Are not. Uh, what works and what advertising product can be reused or can be companies can uh, hire the same designer sometimes even. And they can have a, they can have a similar approach or similar aesthetic as a result of this just looks good. And you can see the passing off then, it doesn't require the actual deception or even the intention to deceive. That if, if you were just deciding, I like those colors as well, my product will use the same colors because red on blue looks nice. I don't know if it does, uh, or if that's eye-catching. But it, then you can see, if you can show that it was the intention, uh, you have a stronger case and the damage will, damages will be a lot higher uh, when they're being awarded. And that they were looking at the, that in those two cases there of range marketing and versus MQ Classics and CNA Modes versus CNA Waterford. And it was just that question of if there is intention to, to mislead, it's like more likely there isn't the case for passing off. So when we're looking at this, as I mentioned, there has to be the risk of confusion to the customers. So we'll be looking at this from a few perspectives of how there's a, there's a general risk and then how certain phrasing or packaging can give rise to risk. And it, of course, said the, there must be a likelihood of confusion, but this can't be an isolated incident. It can't just be one person mixing up uh, McVitie's and Jacob's Chaffigate once because they were on their phone and they had children running around them and it was just that one instance where they got them mixed up there has to be a more not consistent and continuous but an ongoing approach or pattern of confusion uh in the general public and you can see there in uh mccain bridge versus uh joseph Bennett, brennan's bakeries mcmahon j held that it's not necessary to produce evidence that any specific number or numbers of people or any specific person had actually been deceived, provided that they, the goods had been marketed in a way that they could be calculated to deceive. So you don't need to show every single individual who was confused, just that there's a certain class or type of person uh, who would buy that product and that would serve as a, as a, as a focus group or evidence. Uh, you can show that. You, uh, you don't need to show that one person or every person was confused, just that it is a possibility and it can happen. And we look at this and how, a little bit later, how different products have different classifications of the public and what is the, who is the public at large for products. And this is where we get into the idea that, uh, that uh, passing off can depend on the context of the good and how, and the similarities between two products of, are they completely identical? Are they similar products in a similar uh, uh, industry or sim similar, target product, like the two types of fig rolls would be interchangeable. But if one was fig rolls and one was cars, they wouldn't be passing off as much because the risk of confusion is less likely you go into the supermarket to buy biscuits and you come out with a Ford Focus, just as an example. So the test there is determining uh, whether confusion is probable and uh, is the likely impression of the casual and unaware consumer. So the average consumer for the most part will be, uh, will be the test. What, would the average consumer be confused? And they can't say just because we put our names on the label, we clearly advertise we are not brand X, we are brand Y. That itself won't be enough to uh, be the defense because there can be other factors as we will see in the McBride uh, bread case again. Uh, it, certain elements of design can be obscured, certain elements can be confusing. 
And with the confusion, there, it's necessary to, for the plaintiff to establish that the public associated with the goods with a particular firm, that they understand that it is sufficient to establish that the goods are known by a particular name or even by a particular get-up. And in this case, get-up is the general packaging, because it is the language used in the case law for the general packaging of the product, the display, the color, the font, the packet wrapper, whatever. We'll be looking at a fuller list later on. Uh, and this is even where the defendant tends to gauge in a business that is quite different, is slightly different from the uh, consumer, sorry, from, from the, that of the plaintiffs. And in this case, Guinness Ireland Group versus Kilkenny Brewing, they were looking at how Guinness owned the rights to Smithix and a, a, a Kilkenny Brewing Company was, was buying land and was an association, risk of an association or confusion between the two. And when we're looking at this confusion, uh, the, the assessment uh, of these really sets on the grounds of who is likely to, to be confused. And in the case there, Smithline Smith Beecham versus uh, Antigen Pharmaceuticals, it was for the two products of sulfen and sulfonine. And I stumbled on these names in the last class, so I'm a bit better now. But it was a question of confusion that neither product could be sold over the self shelf and it had to be sold over the counter from a qualified pharmacist or trained pharmacy technicians. And even if you went in, there was still a risk of confusion. Confusion, because if you were going in for pain relief medication, you would say that's sulfur stuff or sulfur something. Uh, and we've all done that where we can't remember the name of a medicine. We say something approximate to what it is, and the trained pharmacist will be aware of what we're actually trying to ask. But there is still that risk of confusion, that while the, the actual consumer themselves aren't confused between the products, there is still that risk that when they're conveying that information to the pharmacist, it can, there can be confusion. And that's what we're looking at in this case here, the McCambridge Limited versus Joseph Brennan Bakeries. They were looking at uh, the selling of whole wheat uh, farmer spread. And they were looking at how the packaging, uh, while the products themselves uh, were similar, while the products were a type of bread, there was a question of how the packaging was giving a rise to giving rise to a case of passing off. And while it did clearly say the name and the brand of each bread, uh, you can see there that Pert J referred to the fact that the positioning on this shelf could remove or mitigate uh, the distinguishing features or make them less easily visible. So uh, before the last two weeks where when you went in to buy bread in supermarkets and there was bread on the shelves or people weren't panic buying it. Bread was on the shelf and it was at times it was quite difficult to see unless you're actually picking at the bread what one you're buying or what one you're, you're, you'll be looking for because the colors of the packaging kind of blend. You don't know where one brand starts and the next brand begins. And when that's assuming that the bread is crisp, perfectly stacked. If customers get in there before, other customers get in there before you, they could push bread aside, they can turn over packets, they can make it difficult to see the, that, the front of the label. And Perth J then commented that the result that any reasonable, careful, any, but even a reasonably careful and observant customer may not read or notice uh, the way the differences were presented, that if elements were obscured, if the packets were turned upside down, they could be seen as similar. And the Supreme Court by majority held this was the correct approach and were supportive of this, saying yes, there is a significant risk of confusion. Uh, between these, uh, based on the facts here. So when we're looking at uh, the idea of passing off, it isn't always just going to be uh, the, an, an individual bringing a case against another individual. It can be a collective group. And you can see there, it's only COVID-19 if it comes from Northern Italy, otherwise it's sparking, sparking flu. This is a, the word change, the par, uh, paraphrasing of the old joke, or the old statement of, it's only champagne if it comes from the region. And legally, that is correct. There is rules and regulations we're not going to be getting into that it can only be called champagne if it comes from the Champagne region in France. Anywhere else has to call it uh, sparkling wine or possibly, possibly Prosecco. Uh, but that is to associate the question of goodwill. And parties who share goodwill may individually or collectively protect it uh, by, passing, by passing off action against those who damages. So if there's a reputation in an area, if there's a reputation in for a particular method of making a good or service and it's provided by a small sect or a small group of producers, they can have the goodwill associated with the recognition and the quality of recognition and recognition and reputation 
they have built up in the products. And the champagne is an example of this, where there's been a lot of cases. And you can see there in Balnay versus Costa Brava wine, uh, they were looking at it as Spanish champagne, uh, that while it was a qualifier to show this is not from the champagne region in France, there was still a passing off because they were still trying to benefit from the goodwill and reputation of champagne as a high quality wine. I don't know if it really is, it's a grown up seven up. Uh, it's a bit bubbly, but it's fine. Uh, and they held that this was passing off, that while there was a qualifier to say this is Spanish, it was still trading on the reputation and benefiting from the reputation of champagne as a concept, despite not being from the region. And then that was followed in Tatler versus Aldebra, uh, Albev limited case, which again was uh, using the, the phrase Eden flower champagne. So again, it was a UK brewery uh, manufacturer, but they were benefiting from the reputation of champagne and it was helped passing it off. Excuse me. I need water. So again, you can see there in the Johnny Walker Sons and Henry Oates versus Henry Oates and Butters company, uh, the question of Scotch whiskey. Again, it's a question of quality, quality so and associated goodwill that has developed in relation to Scotch whiskey. And this can apply in Ireland as well, where with, with whiskey, with an E, and how the brewing method of Irish whiskey can only be made in Ireland because of the reputation, is the brewing me mechanism, uh, mechanism, the brewing method and the quality assurance of it, uh, to stop someone in, say, South Florida uh, making Irish whiskey in their bathtub, but brewing it for two days and putting it in antifreeze or uh, water from the Everglades and saying it's Irish whiskey, because it would damage your reputation, or it could damage your reputation if people were confused. But at the same time, there can be the geographical element you have to consider. Is the product known in that area? Is a product available in that area? And in the two cases we'll be looking at, uh, the first is uh, Eridan versus Pavilion Properties and in the Crazy Horse Saloon case. It was a famous Paris nightclub that sought an inj uh, injunction against the defendant, a few company which sought to open a nightclub under the same name. So it would be effectively two nightclubs with the Crazy Horse Saloon name. And the one in Paris had been opened since 1951 and had gained an inter international reputation and had been publicized in the UK since 1951. So since it was open, it was well known, or no, at least known in the UK, and that it was a French nightclub. It was, you go there for a good time. But it was rejected on the fact that the Paris nightclub was outside the jurisdiction and it had very little to do with, with the UK. It had very little to do with the UK nightlife. That you wouldn't, you wouldn't get confused with the case, in, with the Crazy Horse Saloon in the UK you wouldn't go to the wrong pub and then find half your friends are in the other one. So it was a question of the geographical element. Uh, and with tort, there are rules for international tour, uh, and the champagne cases were, were some examples of it. On the previous slide. But there was very little footprint there. There was very little engagement of the French nightclub in the UK. So it wasn't, the goodwill wasn't that strong and the other elements overruled it. And that's just a larger quote of why the courts uh, decided against it. And then in CNA modes versus CNA water for limited, again, they were looking at the question of what was the geographical location. And you can see there that defendant had been trading in them uh, since 1951 with 56 stores in the UK, including Belfast. And they started, the uh, defendant was selling drapery and curtains and stuff uh, under the trading name CNA Waterford Limited. And the plaintiff sought an injunction to stop them doing this, from, to stop them from using this name and benefiting from the goodwill they had generated since 1951. And the defendants argued that they, they didn't exist in Ireland, that their shops were just in the UK and they had no reputation or goodwill generated in Ireland. But the courts were looking at this and held that passing off had occurred uh, since or could have occurred, uh, that passing off could be occurring uh, as a number of shoppers from the Republic had been aware of CNA modes in Belfast. And there was a train from Dublin to Belfast, not with the express purpose of going to that shop, but it was available that members of the Republic could 
go to uh, Belfast and, and shop there. Additionally, at the time, uh, there was substantial, substantial advertisement from CNA in the English papers and English media, which were circulated in Ireland and the UK. So anyone who was born before, I think like mid-90s, before we got digital television in Ireland, we had a lot of the English channels, so BBC One to ITV or UTV, Channel 4, then RT1 to TV3 and TG Carr. And because of this, we were getting a lot of UK advertisement and, and CNA modes had advertised here. But even at that, even if CNA modes had been known within the Republic of Ireland, it wasn't that well known. It wasn't an outstanding place that it was known in the sense of this exists. We, we might have heard that name or we, we as a public uh, recognise it. And of course, that it rejected the claim of passing off on this grounds that it needed a more substantive presence to generate the goodwill, that what they had wasn't enough. And one second. Something beeping on the side. Uh, I'm just checking to see the chat because it's not looking for me. Sorry, I had something wrong there. And yeah, technical issues are fun when. Everything seems to be going wrong. Yeah, there we go. Sorry. So, sorry, one second. So when we're looking at this, we're looking at them, uh, the geographical goodwill has to exist and how the question of misrepresentation is the next bit of the question we have to look at. And as we saw from the previous case where the courts have accepted uh, the question of passing off, they do need the, the risk of misrepresentation and confusion. And they've made it clear that confusion, there, there must be likelihood or risk of confusion uh, for passing off to occur. And that's what they're looking at in the Jacobs uh, Fruitfield versus United Biscuits case. Uh, the typical person, <coughs> bit of a tough. Uh, and that's what they're looking at. What is confusion? So the typical purchaser is the key bit they were looking at here. That they might be, can, well, might be, might might likely be looking at us. And the typical way the the product concerned is likely likely to be presented to the public. And the typical way the public is uh, likely to make its decisions concerning the purchase of the product is what they're looking at for how confusion works and how misrepresentation works. And when they're looking at this, they look at it, you know, what is a packaging? What is the get up again? And where they're going from here. And when they're looking at this confusion, as I mentioned before, you have to look at the broader circumstances of, the, of who the purchaser is, who the buyer is, how their attitudes or their knowledge and their context of the buyer can uh, affect the situation and how the overall context of the products can play a part. And we saw this in the McBride uh, case surrounding circumstances uh, where supermarkets would have bread on the shelves that could be obscuring other breads. That could be a factor. Who is buying it? Is it someone who buys bread often? Is it the first time? excuse me, is their first time buying the bread and not sure what, what it is. So these have to be taken into account. And you can see there in the uh, McCambridge case, uh, put themselves in the shoes of the re reasonably prudent shopper who is not in any particular hurry and who's neither over scrupulous or dilatory and who enters the shop with, with the wish to pur purchase a loaf of, of whole wheat white bread, whole wheat, whole wheat bread. And that's what they're looking at. Uh, You put yourself in the reasonable position of the buyer of that product with reasonable time. They're not being too picky. They're not being too fast. 
the question, so there are some further questions we're looking at of who the average buyer is for certain products. But they were they were, that's what, that is the general test. The test is rather the impression likely to be produced on the likely consumer taken into account. The consumer's uh, perception and imperfect recollection because people aren't perfect. Uh, people are people. It's really that simple. And that's what they're looking at in the Tatler versus Albert case, uh, where the champagne producer sues the defendant of Eden Flower Champagne uh, on the grounds that it was likely to present to, to misrepresent the product as was likely to confuse the average consumer. And the product was a non alcoholic beverage made from flowers, so the defendant would argue it's not champagne, it's quite clear. Uh, they're not buying an alcoholic drink, they will know this isn't the product, this isn't champagne from the champagne region. And at first instance, uh, it's held that although a misrepresentation, that, uh, misrepresentation, misrepresentation is not likely to confuse the average consumer, it was appealed. And they did misrep, the, the unappealed Gibson LJ did say mis, mis, there was misrepresentation through its naming of Eden or Champagne again, creating a link with the Champagne region uh, where it was not a bubbly alcoholic drink. And you can see there at the end, champagne is a distinctly exclusive, is a, is a distinctly exclusively, a distinctive exclusively of a champagne wine produced in Champagne, Champagne region in France. So anything outside of that is will be misleading. That you're trying to benefit from the reputation uh, that champagne is a high quality product, and by having champagne in the name of your own product. Uh, would be to try and indicate, indicate a similar quality or status of the product. And again, in the Bolognese versus Costa Brava case, which we looked at, uh, they're just looking at how this could amount to misrepresentation. And this was the one, the, sorry, those slides shouldn't be there. Uh, what is the, the Spanish champagne that, uh, you can see there that nevertheless, uh, a more in a hurry would confuse it, but, it's, uh, but it, is in, it is proper to take into account the ignorant and the unwary. So you have to take into account consumers who are passing by. They, won't ha they may not always have time to research every product. They may not have time to Google every single brand of, in the supermarket when they're shopping. Uh, so there was a question there. And you can, it's kind of goes to the idea that it's not necessary to show that all consumers in the relevant section of the public of who is buying the product uh, have been deceived. The courts uh, held that they're looking at a substantive or substantial uh, part of the public are confused. And it's not entirely just a large enough part. And that was in the Lego versus uh, Lemel case. It was held that passing off only arises if there's a real risk that a substantial number of persons among the relevant sections of the public will in fact believe there is a business connection between the plaintiff and the defendant. So it's not everyone who buys the product or every potential customer. It's in just enough of a large section, a large amount of them will be sufficient to give rise to passing off through misrepresentation and confusion. So the next bit I just want to be looking at, we're going to be looking at just some, at, uh, some of the ways of passing on through the product, the place name, the phrasing of it, and how this works. And as I mentioned before, the getup of the packaging, the general getup uh, looks at the size and shape, the material, the combination, the colors, the decoration, the lettering, the arrangement of the label, and finally the overall picture they present from the combination. And in the last class, some students asked, uh, how could Coca-Cola take a passing off action against a store versions of cola drinks. And if you look at the products that while they are similar, that there is a similar size, a two liter bottle will be a two liter bottle. It will be more uh, vertical than flat. The cola drinks will tend to have red unless they're Pepsi, the superior cola drink. Uh, the material used will be a plastic uh, lead bottle or glass if they're fancy. Uh, the combination of decorative lettering, the arrangement of the label, the spacing will be similar. But they'll be presented in a way that they will be shown, indicating that they are an alternative and not the Coca-Cola brand. If you look at the Dunn stores and little equivalents, uh, look where the label is on the actual bottle, on the bottle of cola. 
Uh, on Coke, it's quite high up on the bottle. On the little one, it's quite low. The f it's a single word in blockier letters, as opposed to Coca-Cola's uh, well-known script on how they actually write Coca-Cola. Uh, different brands will use different coloring, but they will still have a similar motifs or similar themes to show this is a cola, a fizzy cola drink. If you don't want brand X, you can buy brand Y. They'll be similarly located and they will be okay. To, they will be uh, similar, but they won't, it won't be enough that they're passing off as the other product. And that's just a distinction to look at of where there are similar products. They use the same packaging and the same get general get up to indicate they're an alternative without passing off or trading on the reputation. And they were looking at packaging in a number of cases. You can see there in the polycell case, uh, it's more sellotape. And that while they had uh, two very different names of cling cell and polycell, even if you pronounce them, they are quite different. Uh, they had a similar packaging and similar design and color. So the pack, the, if you're looking at them and you couldn't see the name, you may not be able to tell the difference. And that was enough to override the fact they had very clearly different names, brand names. And it was enough to say that this, this was passing off. Uh, and then again, the United Biscuits case uh, versus Irish Biscuits case, there's a lot of biscuit cases. Uh, the plaintiffs uh, manufactured the Biscuits College Creams and claimed that the defendant's company who manufactured the Biscuits College Creams were guilty of passing off. Similar enough, I nearly tripped up on it a few times when I was uh, doing a uh, practice little version of this earlier. But the package of the biscuits sold to the public uh, were quite different. They were entirely different, as she says there, in design and color. The biscuits themselves were similar. And the argument was actually put forward that they are similar enough biscuits. If you try one or you're given one by somebody you know, they will say, hey, that cottage. Uh, it's cottage creams, and you go out and buy college creams, uh, that would be a risk in, uh, to the reputation of the biscuits of cottage cream. And they, they, they try to make this argument, but uh, Kenny J rejected that the public might be confused after sampling them and trying to buy them in the shop. And it was rejected as both brands were sold in the packaging where you couldn't see the biscuits. Uh, the size, appearance, and texture of the biscuits was not relevant to this case. And while the biscuits themselves were similar. The packaging was so different, you wouldn't confuse the two of them. Uh, and there would be no uh, reason for passing off. And I just included that quote because I, I just thought it was funny. Uh, he went on to say that similarities in biscuits, which are sold in packages, can never be a, pa never be a passing off claim. Uh, I, just, I just thought it was funny that they're talking about biscuits in court. It happens a lot because we have the Jacobs versus United Biscuits case. And this is McVitie's versus Jacobs Fibros, which is their passing off. And held, their held was yes. Uh, there was a real risk of confusion that the packaging was noted as being remarkably similar. If you go into the shop, I've been confused by this myself. I bought the wrong Fibros, and I've never tried so hard in my life when I come home and realize. But there was a real risk on the get up. Even the fact that they said Fibros written on. Um, a similar, fanner, a, sim a similar manner, the logos were small, uh, but even they, though they did say McVitie's and Jacob's on their respective packets, there was still enough of everything else to give rise to a real risk of confusion. And they held that this was a pass it off. Um, one last is the case for today. It's not in relation to court law and won't be relevant for your essay or anything, but there was an actual case determining if Jaffa cakes were biscuits or cakes. Uh, have a look at it. But the last bit, just we're going to be finishing up the uh, next couple of minutes. Uh, the products, and, the names of the products can also give rise to passing off. The products often carry names that identify them. This is the brand name or the company name. And where two products have readily identified names of two different manufacturers, this is naturally a factor leaning against uh, finding a passing off. But as with most stuff of passing off, it has to be looked at in the overall context, even if the names are clearly labeled, uh, as we saw in the McCambridge versus uh, Johnson Brennan Bakeries, even if the names are clear, 
These can be covered, they can be obscured, and the other elements of the packaging, the overall getup, have to then be considered. And that's what they're looking at there. Um, but while the names were quite clearly labeled, other factors were stronger, which led to the risk and the actuality of confusion among shoppers. McManaman and Jay acknowledged that that was true. There was a difference in names, it will often be enough to warn the public that they are getting the traders' goods and not on others. But you have to take this in the broader context of where the product has been sold. And there is a question of how you, uh, the difficulty in setting out clear legal principles uh, in two cases where the confusion results by the use of the defendants of their actual name. So if you have a name you want to trade as, if you want to sell a product of, say, how you want to sell Liam Sunner's world class biscuits, and there's another, someone else trading as Liam Sunner's biscuits, uh, there could be an issue of, can I, is it passing off or am I just using my name? So in Ireland, we have McDonald's soup. How is that different to McDonald's as a burger chain? And just the indication there of don't change your name to Starbucks to try start a coffee company. It won't work. For a reason. And in the cases you can see there, of Turton versus Turton, the courts were a bit more sympathetic towards the defendant that this kind of goes back to more Tory and Elizabethan era importance of the name itself. And when they were given these cases that there was the issue of uh, protecting the, the defendant, that they just have to have that name. It's not their fault that there's another brand that they're already with us. And they can't, that's how it kind of went on for a while. Sorry, I just got a question there from one student. Uh, so when, yeah, sorry, just remember your question. Uh, some of that is, uh, question, is pushing line. You gave the example of little brand version of Chris called Hunky Dory, uh, as opposed to Hunky Dory Chris, which are an established brand name. And they use the same color scheme. Um, this, I haven't seen that the one, the brand called Hunky Dory, uh, but it is very similar and it is very confusing. There would likely be a case that they could take a, a claim of passing off that it, I, just, on, just from the name and the fact they have a very similar color scheme, I was getting confused there for a second reading it. There would be passing off. Uh, that likely would be a case of passing off, but because they're not being sold in the same uh, location, that may be why they can do it. It's, if, it's not an, uh, if it's not a store brand, uh, but rather one that uh, shops as you gave the example of little, uh, unless it was like a little brand, uh, Chris using the color, the color scheme, I think that would be passing off. I you gave the, you used the example of Dunn stores earlier because I know Dunn stores have their own brand. I think it's Saint Bernard's, or is it just labeled as Dunn stores? Uh, or Tesco even have their the Tesco brand products that they're labeled as Tesco Everyday or Tesco's Finest uh, as the products, and they would be okay for defending a claim against passing off. But the example you gave here of the, the little brand version is Hunky Dory's versus the original Hunky Dory Chris with a very similar, with, a, with the same color scheme. And I'm assuming it's a similar enough font and basing on the packaging. I haven't seen the crisps. Uh, but I would say that would be a, a likely ground for passing off. And why it hasn't been taken, I'm, I'm not too sure, but it, that would be an example of how it works. That is actually very, that was a, that's an interesting example. And when your classmates made that example as well of own brand uh, cola drinks in supermarkets, but just as the distinction between your own brand using the same colors, the same motifs, the same design elements to indicate this is an alternative, as opposed to what I would say there is passing off. Uh, there may be other factors that if you're buying in, certain shops, they may not have carry the original brand and that might be a justification of, or a defense of why they can sell the passing off version, why they could sell hunky dories rather than hunky dories. Uh, but I don't think that's the strongest ground for a, as a defense, that if it was really challenged, I think it, it would be a successful passing off case. Does that answer your question? Perfect. Uh, 
sorry, so that was just an example. A student emailed me a question in private. That will come up as a grey box on your on the, on the recording or should be a grey box on your screen. If you do have any questions, I do get them all at once. Uh, so do feel free to contribute. If you aren't sure about anything, uh, you have the anonymous nature. It's not going to be like in a question in class if you don't feel comfortable asking it. I'm not going to force you to, to engage. But if you do have questions like that, it is, it is there for you. So when the courts were looking at the, uh, the use of defendant's name, they looked at it from the mens rea or the intention behind uh, its use. Were you using it in good faith or honestly? And this is why I gave the example of don't change your name to Starbucks to start a coffee company. You're not doing that in good faith. You, know, you would know Starbucks or you should know Starbucks as a well enough brand name globally for this to go ahead. And this is an example there in Dickinson and Dickinson versus Dixon, sorry, Dixon and Dixon, Dixon and Sons versus Dixon and Sons. I'm confused. Uh, and they changed, held that the defendant couldn't use the name and Sons since while he did have Sons, uh, they weren't actually partners in the company. They were invited to be partners in the company, but they had refused. So he was using Dick, the and Sons bit as just branding because his sons weren't really involved in the company. While the plaintiff, was found his sons were part of the company, they were joint owners. So that they could use it there. And that's how you look at some of the names, uh, the difference in naming, uh, where you can, you know, are you using your name in good faith? Are you using it because it's your name? Or are you using the name because it's associated with a brand already? So just it is some of the stuff they have to, you have to be careful about when you look at these cases. And this is what they were looking at in the O'Neill's Irish International Sports versus O'Neill's footwear trying company. And this is the last slide, so I'm just going to get more there for now. There was no doubt that uh, John O'Neill believed, uh, that John O'Neill defendant believed his, that since his name was O'Neill, he could form a company with O'Neill in its name and market his product under that name. Under that name. In that belief, he was wrong. While a person may use his own name in the course of trade and cannot be faulted on those grounds alone, that does not entitle him to use his name in such a way as it was calculated to lead others to believe the goods were those of another. And that's, that is the case here. So in this case, John O'Neill, the defendant, was using his name, what he was using as a name, he was using it with the intention to create a link to the O'Neill sports brand. And that's why he wasn't allowed to use his name in this case. So it really is, are you using your name because it's your name or you're using your name because it's beneficial? I can get away with this because my name is Liam Sunner. I'm the only one in the world, I think. So anyone, I can trade as Liam Sunner, that's fine. Uh, if your name was Tom Cruise and you were, or you were named after the actor, you couldn't start trading as Tom Cruise Incorporated or Tom Cruise Acting Lessons uh, and with the intention of tricking people into thinking you are that Tom Cruise. And it really goes to the idea of what is the bona fide, what is the, the, the fair use of your name? Are you doing this honestly, or are you doing this for an economic benefit and trading and benefiting from someone else's reputation and goodwill? And I think that's the last slide. Yeah, that's the last slide. But with names, you have to be, they do, you have to be careful because of how there's only so many numbers of names in the world, really just, are you using your name correctly? Are you using your name for the sake of your own name? And this can be used for passing off. Uh, yeah, so we'll stop there. I'll, I'm gonna stop the recording now, but if anyone else has any questions,